Hello, I'm Gay Yee Hill. Welcome to NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. 2011 is one of the busiest years ever in planet exploration. We have four space missions launching this year, plus a meetup with an asteroid just weeks away. In the last few months, we've had two comet flybys. On Valentine's Day, Stardust Next took us on a return visit to Comet Temple 1. And in November, JPL's epoxy mission zoomed past a peanut-shaped comet, Hartley 2, and found itself in an ice storm. And the left screen flashes red. The next image should be the high resolution. Congratulations on a fantastic flyby. Good job, everybody. We flew by it at a speed of about 27,000 miles per hour, and uh, the spacecraft was slightly below the comet in a sun plane. Who would have thought that we actually get to see a comet close up like we just did? And when we first saw this, our mouths just dropped. To me, this whole thing looks like a snow globe that you're sh just simply shaking and watching it fly. When we saw the images come down, even in real time in the raw data, and realized we had a cloud of snow around the nucleus, we were astounded. Those are not stars. Those are all chunks of ice. We think the biggest ones are at least the size of a golf ball and possibly up to the size of a basketball. So what that means is that the snowballs are not what we might have thought to begin with. We're not seeing softballs or even ice cubes. What we're seeing are fluffy aggregates of very small pieces of ice. Was this mission 100% successful in terms of the science? I would have to say no. It was 1,000% successful. <laughs> we achieved all of our science objectives. We do, in fact, have a comparison of the deep impact area. And it, in fact, does show an impact crater. This spacecraft, Stardust, uh, went through this cloud of dust and rocks coming off the comet. We have instruments on the front of the spacecraft called a dust flux monitor instrument, and they have sensors to detect these impacts. A good analogy of thinking of, of a, like a B-17 in World War II flying through flak. That's it. <laughs> I have a message for any school kids out there who might be wondering how NASA can send a spacecraft billions of miles through the solar system and somehow wind up flying so close to a tiny comet only a few kilometers in diameter. It's done with math. <laughs> Did you know that both comet missions were carried out using recycled spacecraft? That's right. They were originally used for other missions and repurposed to conduct new jobs before the fuel ran out makes economic sense, a way of stretching taxpayer dollars by doing a second mission at one-tenth of the usual cost. Another mission that's studying small solar system bodies is about to reach a major milestone. JPL's Dawn is just months away from reaching its first port of call in the asteroid belt, Vesta. Some people think it's an asteroid, but others think it's a protoplanet, a celestial body that almost formed into a planet, but never quite made it. The mission's goal is to compare Vesta and the dwarf planet Ceres, two of the largest residents of the asteroid belt. The spacecraft is on its final approach to Vesta and should arrive around July 16th. Dawn will orbit Vesta for one year and then head to its second destination, Ceres, in 2015. Scientists think both alien worlds will provide important insights into the dawn of the solar system. That's why the mission is called Dawn. JPL robotic missions teach us about other worlds. They also teach us a lot about one very important planet, our own. This June, our Aquarius mission will launch from Vandenberg Air Force Base to begin studying an important piece of Earth's climate puzzle, salt. Salt in the oceans affect the water cycle, ocean circulation, and our climate.
when we're talking about salt in the ocean, we're talking pretty much the same salt that you use in cooking, the chemical known as sodium chloride. You've been to the beach, you've gone swimming in the ocean, you know that the ocean is salty. What most people don't recognize is that the concentration of salt, or what we call salinity, varies quite a bit from one part of the ocean to another. When water evaporates off the sea surface and goes into the atmosphere, that makes the water saltier because you're taking fresh water out and you're leaving more salt behind. As the minerals of the salt circulates around in the oceans, it moves heat around. Heat that's carried by the ocean affects the atmosphere. The changes of the atmosphere and the sea surface temperature is coupled together. It controls climate. We have measured sea surface temperature. We've measured winds over water, sea level rise, color of the ocean. But yet, we do not know one of the fundamental properties that affect climate, which is the density or the concentration of salt in the ocean. Salinity is one of the missing parameters we've never been measured from space before. We have no salinity samples at all from parts of the world, particularly in the southern hemisphere, in the South Pacific and the South Atlantic and Southern Indian Oceans. So there's a big data gap. This mission called Aquarius is one of the most exciting missions to date. It measures how salty the ocean is from space. As you take a pinch of salt and you put in a gallon of water, we can measure that kind of sensitivity of salt from 408 miles above the Earth. In seven days, we'll map the entire Earth and go back to the same point, measuring it over and over again, and we'll monitor over time how the changes and variability are. By having salinity information from space, we'll provide this missing link and make better predictions on the climate change and climate model. All the measurements that we make in the Earth Sciences program within NASA are really to better understand the climate processes that are happening now, how we can use that information to better predict the future so we can plan better. Salinity is one of those measurements that we need to fill an important gap to do that very thing. That's how it affects you and me and the person next door. Another Earth mission, the Gravity and Recovery Climate Experiment, or GRACE, is so successful there's about to be a spin-off. The technology of using twin satellites to make detailed measurements of Earth's gravity field that GRACE demonstrated will now be applied to the moon. It's about to be used in a mission called the Gravity Recovery and Interior Laboratory, or GRAIL. We've landed people on the moon, we've orbited spacecraft around the moon, but the part of lunar understanding that we don't yet have is what's inside the moon. GRAIL is a mission which is going to study the interior structure and evolution of the moon. We'll actually be sending two spacecraft to the moon. By measuring distance change between the two spacecraft very precisely, believe it or not, we're going to be able to reconstruct what the interior of the moon is made of and how it got to be the way that it is today. It's a little bit like doing a CAT scan of the moon. Understanding the lunar interior allows us to go back and study aspects of what the Earth was like in its earliest history. GRAIL is the first planetary mission to carry instruments that are entirely devoted to education and outreach. We will have up to four cameras on each GRAIL spacecraft that will be used solely for school children to propose targets that they would like to image on the surface of the moon. We expect students to learn a lot about the process of what it takes to operate instrumentation in space. This experiment is going to teach students a great deal about the moon itself. And we also expect that it's going to go a long way towards helping students understand just how much fun science and engineering is as a career. The GRAIL mission launches in September. Now let's check out our Mars exploration rover, Spirit and Opportunity. The rovers were built with warranties to operate 90 days on Mars. Instead, they've both given us years of bonus time and missions. Spirit hasn't communicated with Earth since March 2010, and it's possible we may not hear from it again. But Opportunity remains active and continues its long journey to Endeavor Crater. It's 
been seven years since the rovers landed on Mars. This was originally a 90-day mission, only three months. The fact that they've lasted this long and driven this far was a nobody's imagination. Opportunity has crossed almost 26 kilometers of odometry, uh, and it's still in very good health. That, that's amazing after seven years. Opportunities in kind of a desert trek mode ever since we've left Victoria. Opportunity now is located at Santa Maria Crater. It's one of the freshest craters that either rover has had a chance to explore. And there's also evidence of some hydrated sulfate minerals around the southeast corner of this crater. They can only form when there's been water along for a really long period of time. The next big adventure for that rover, and that's to get to Endeavor Crater, which is a giant crater that's still some six kilometers uh, away from where the rover is right now. We're trying to do a balance of driving as fast as we can, but making sure we don't miss anything critical as we drive. Endeavor is such a large crater, we might start seeing rocks ejected from Endeavor well before we get there. That's our next big objective because we know there are these clay minerals present in the rim of Endeavor Crater that is suggestive of ancient water on Mars that was of neutral pH. Uh, neutral water is what astrobiologists um, assess that life started in. And so the fact that there is uh, evidence of ancient neutral water on Mars is very exciting for the biopotential of the planet. It's an exciting time over the next um, year or so while, while we get this underway. For now, all eyes are focused on our next rover mission to the Red Planet, the Mars Science Laboratory, better known as Curiosity. We've been documenting the construction and testing, and we put it on the web in our ongoing series, Building Curiosity. Today is a really exciting day. It's a milestone for MSL, in the sense that the first time we're seeing the rover drive on its own wheels, uh, its own mobility system. It's gone from designs on napkins to PowerPoint, you know, to uh, CAD drawings, to blueprints, and now it's a rover. So just recently we installed the robotic arm. It was a major milestone for the project, not only for the engineers that worked on this arm for years, designing, assembling it, and finally delivering it, but for the project as a whole. The tests we're doing now are actually helping us learn how to drive the arm from both the operator side as well as the, the flight software side helping us develop that rover hand-eye coordination. We just recently completed testing the wheels and suspension system on the flight rover. It's a classic rocker bogey suspension system that we've used for the last two generations of Mars rovers. So for this mission, the mobility system not only drives the rover around, it's also the landing gear. The wheels are actually the first thing that make contact with the surface of Mars. So what we're doing today is we're getting ready for system test. So what the guys are doing now is they're electrically connecting up each of the vehicles together so it thinks it's mechanically hooked together, which tells the rover or makes the rover think that it's going to go through all its mission phases. We ran a major test called the Sky Crane Full Motion Drop Test. So this is the sequence leading up to that touchdown on Mars. We're here in the Environmental Test Facility at JPL where Curiosity is going through a series of random vibration tests. The Mars Yard was created to try to simulate the types of different terrains that we might encounter on the surface of Mars. We have everything on this Mars Yard from rocks that are the size of about 25 to 30 inches in height to varying slopes. Uh, we just got out of vibration testing, which is the shake portion, and now we're moving on to the bake portion, which would be our thermal vacuum testing, at which point we can start changing the temperature inside and pumping down the pressure to simulate Mars conditions. We've done a lot of testing already here at JPL. Now, we're packing up our table and getting ready to ship it to Florida. In Florida, we'll be doing the most exciting test of all, a full spacecraft with fuel loaded on the table, measuring it to make sure it's ready for launch.
JPL Rovers come in all shapes and sizes. One of them, the all-terrain, hex-limbed, extraterrestrial explorer, is enormous. Athlete, as it's called, is big because it's designed for human exploration. It's a people mover. But despite its size, it's quite nimble. Just for fun, we took athletes' moves and sped them up to music and put the video on YouTube. It got more than 175,000 hits, plus a spot on the TV show so you think you can dance. Take a look. Moving on now from our biggest rover to the largest planet, our mission Juno will head to the granddaddy in the solar system, Jupiter. Jupiter's composition hasn't changed since the solar system began, and scientists believe studying it will be like looking into a time capsule that's five billion years old. Jupiter is the fifth planet from the sun, and the largest planet in our solar system. Because of its enormous size and powerful gravity, it's believed Jupiter has influenced the formation and evolution of the other bodies that orbit our sun. Hundreds of scientists and engineers in five countries have been working for more than 10 years to design and build a spacecraft to Jupiter. Mission Juno will conduct an unprecedented examination of the atmosphere, the interior, and the vast magnetic field of the giant planet. If we want to understand how do planets form, how do solar systems form, we really have to start with Jupiter. By studying Jupiter, you're going to get one piece of the puzzle, um, not necessarily how life formed, but maybe how the ingredients that made up life eventually got spread around in the early solar system and got to us. When the Earth formed, in the absence of Jupiter, it probably would have gathered very little water and organic molecules, which would have been concentrated in the colder, outer part of the solar system. What Jupiter evidently did as it formed was to scatter cold material that contained water ice and organic materials to the inner solar system where it could be captured by the Earth and the other terrestrial planets. We learn about the origin of the solar system, we're learning about our own origins, we're learning about how life comes to be, about who we are and what our place is in the universe. It's about knowledge and about humanity's quest to understand. Juno will study Jupiter in unprecedented detail for more than a year. In our quest to unlock the history of the planets, Jupiter is the gateway and Juno is the key. The Juno mission is scheduled for launch in early August. So there, now you're up to date and up to the minute with JPL highlights. Visit our homepage at jpl.nasa.gov. You'll find all sorts of things there, including our new Space Images website and great apps for your iPhone, iPad, and Android. Sign up for email news or receive texts by texting JPL News to 67463. And of course, you can always connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, Flickr, Ustream, or YouTube. It's all there. We hope this is the beginning of a great relationship. Thanks for visiting.